everybody. My name is Carlos Gutierrez. I am the co-founding executive director of Cinema Tropical and want to welcome you to this very special edition of Tropic Chat 20, uh, where we have a, a series of uh, talks with key filmmakers from Latin American key film professionals. And uh, I'm really honored to have a, such a wonderful guest today, uh, the great, clever Mendoza Filio, uh, who's not a, only a very talented and a pretty amazing filmmaker, uh, but also, you know, he also worked as a film critic and He's also being a, uh, an important force in film programming. Clever, welcome. Thank you very much, Carl. It's great being here with you. A great, a great pleasure to, to, to have you. Um, Clever was born in Recife, in the northeast of Brazil. Uh, he studied journalism at the University of Pernambuco and worked as a film critic, um, writing for uh, numerous publications. In the 90s, he started experimenting with uh, different video formats before migrating to digital and 35 millimeter uh, film. And he made several short films, including uh, The Little Cotton Girl, Green Vinyl, Electrodomestic, and Cold Tropic um, in the first day, decade of a new century. And all of the films traveled to numerous film festivals. Uh, in 2008, he made the documentary film Critico, uh, in which he interviewed numerous film filmmakers and critics in the relationship between in the relationship about film criticism. And in 2012, he premiered his debut fiction film, Neighboring Sounds, which was named one of the best films of the year by the New York Times also was a winner of the Cinema Tropical Award for Best Film of the Year. And um, it was shown in, uh, had, a, had, a, had a big impact uh, internationally. Four, year late, four years later, in 2016, his second, his second feature film, Aquarius, starring uh, the wonderful Sonia Braga, had his world premiere at, in the main competition at the Cannes Film Festival. And it was sold to more than 100 countries and was nominated for a Cesar Award in France and Independent Spirit Award. And two years ago, in 2019, he came back to the main competition at Cannes with Bacurau, which he co-directed with Giuliano Dornelles, and the film won the jury prize. His feature films have received more than 120 awards internationally and have played at the most important film festivals. Um, and as I mentioned, he combines his filmmaking work with, with his work as a programmer, and uh, he's become such a major uh, force, not only in Latin American cinema, but internationally. So again, clever welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, let's start from the beginning. Um, why did you study journalism? I'm really curious why did you decided to go first to journalism school? What, what, what brought you to journalism? Well, I, I, my, my family had uh, moved to England in, in the 80s. My mother was a, a historian and she became a student. She went back to studying uh, for her PhD. Uh, which she developed in England at Essex University. And, and after almost five years, we came back. I, I came back to Brazil as, a, as an 18 year old. And, uh, and I, I, I already loved uh, film. <clears throat> and um, Recife at the time did not have a film school. Um, so I thought that the closest, um, the closest uh, thing to film school would be journalism. I, I enjoyed writing. Uh, it was actually the only thing uh, I did well in, in school was writing because I was not good with numbers and hmm. terrible at math, mm -hmm. have always been. Uh, and, and then I went into journalism school and, and everything I Everything I tried, my hand at journalism school, I, I tried to bring closer to film, uh, studying film, writing about film, uh, using the equipment, very simple, basic equipment uh, at, mm -hmm. uh, at the university. Um, and, and then I just, uh, yeah, I, I, I just tried to move closer to cinema. Um, and when I graduated, uh, I I was actually a, an English teacher <laughs> for oh, well. maybe three years, mm -hmm. and then finally uh, I worked as a journalism as a journalist, uh, writing about culture and about film, and that's how I, how how I became a a film critic. And uh, how did that background in journalism has affected your work as a as a filmmaker? It's very hard to say, Carlos, because. I mean, I think everything you do in life, um, you gather 
experience and, and information. Mm -hmm. uh, I think journalism, I mean, of course, uh, when you're young, you have, you have a romantic notion of journalism, which, which, is, which is actually a beautiful notion. Um, I don't know, you think of so many great people, uh, not only from your own country, people who made a difference and who wrote great stories, you know, in, in, in Brazil, I, I thought a lot about Graciliano Ramos. Mm -hmm. he, he wrote uh, great pieces in the, in the late 19th century. And, and then of course I could think about the Americans, uh, Andre Thompson. <laughs> um, and, and then you think about, you know, journalism and, and writing about history and poetry. And, but then of course, when you start working in a newspaper, you realize that things are not that romantic. Um, you really have to face the, the reality of uh, of where the newspaper wants things to go and wants mm -hmm. you to go as a as a writer. And things you shouldn't touch, or even if you touch, uh, it has to be in a certain way for political reasons or financial reasons. So I think a lot of that gave me experience in life, you know, experience on looking at society and looking at things and telling stories, I think. But as I said, I, uh, since I was in school, in high school, I, I already enjoyed writing. I, I, I enjoyed writing little short stories, or maybe I would see a film and write about the film or try to describe the film or try to express uh, what I felt watching the mm -hmm. film, which I think is, is an interesting way of dealing with books and films. And so I, I think um, your question makes complete sense, but at the same time, it, it's, it's a little hard to explain uh, uh, how journalism might have uh, impacted, uh, I think it impacted, uh, it had a strong impact, I think, on, on mm -hmm. things that I have done so far. Uh, like the, like the type the, of research, the, the type of research you do for a, for a film, also, I imagine it's also like informed by those, by that journalism mentality, you know, the, the type of how you gather information and prepare for films. I imagine that there's part of that as well, no? Yeah, uh, I, I was just thinking that um, the when I wrote Neighboring Sounds, I, 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 I would ask my my friends, what if what if I wrote this film, which which would be set in a in a normal suburban street, but it would have the the logic of a of a sugarcane plantation, you know, the relationships between sure. the people, and but the film would never tell you that, and and I can say that the that ex, that idea came from from my work in the newspaper actually, mm -hmm. <laughs> because it 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 was a modern uh, company, you know, with all the technology and everything, but I thought the 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 interaction between the ones with power and, and the ones with less power was was very much uh, dictated by by how things operate in 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 the state of Pernambuco where I come from and of course in Brazil as a country so I think that the working inside the newspaper uh, I think uh, was the the initial you know the spark for for the whole idea of neighboring sounds. So you were mentioning that, that you were doing some exercises in uh, some video exercises in school. So at what at what moment is that you decided to to to, to make films to make sure start making short films? And how was that process of from writing to to making films? Well, um, yeah, when I was in my teens, I, I I had these ideas of you know making films, but but I had never even touched uh, you know a video camera or a Super 8 camera at the time. When I got to university, it was the first time that I could actually have access to, to some form of technology. And, uh, and I really went for it because uh, it, it, it was there, it was available. It, it was very simple, it was VHS. Mm -hmm. um, 
but but you know i still enjoy some of the the videos that i did uh, at the time I, I did them with i made them with friends and colleagues uh, from university as, as group work or or maybe um films i directed uh, but i i invited people to to take part and and i remember the the most difficult thing about uh doing this thing doing a video or developing an idea for a short film was was uh, where should i put the camera you know that was the the biggest challenge which i think is still uh, the biggest uh, challenge uh, whenever you make a film you know? uh where <laughs> where can i put the camera is it here is it there maybe it's up maybe it's down maybe it's outside the window so you know uh, it, it was um, it, it the the first um, feeling was was a little bit like a nightmare you know where sh where do we put the camera you know, mm -hmm. there are so many possibilities uh, when you uh, when you want when you have to start and and, and do this the, try to develop these ideas that that you uh, wrote down on a piece of paper or something like it, a script sure it seems you were having a lot of fun during those times experimenting with different formats and different genres and I mean, which you continue up until this day but it seemed like you were like completely uh, playful uh, you had a very playful approach to cinema in that sense you know experimenting no? yeah i think playful is a great word um uh it, it, i mean of course uh, no real money was being spent i mean we we didn't spend anything to rent the equipment uh, i might have spent money uh, on uh, you know fuel maybe new tapes <laughs> um maybe food when we got hungry but but it was money was never really even mentioned because it just uh, we we spent oh, close to nothing um so the whole idea in fact I, I went through the whole 90s uh working like that just making these videos i guess i had a lot of energy to develop these ideas and and slowly i became known as a video maker which i mean was a, a very big thing at the time because if you worked with film you would be a filmmaker right as in 16 millimeter and 35 millimeter and uh if if you worked with beta cam and and all the other formats you you would always be the video maker and and i i i, I have told this story a few times uh, you would get to a festival you were finally selected with your little video and you would get to the festival and slowly realize that the film people would be in the good hotel and then the video people would be in the crappy hotel and so that that was part of the package but it was uh, I, I mean of course it was a, a moment when i where i learned um, i learned how to edit um, i learned how to you know where to put the camera uh, mm -hmm. and working with sound I, I i did everything if you see the videos from that time you can see um <laughs> seven or different eight seven or eight different functions and it's all me it's not an ego thing i just thought that i should you know name it um, yeah and then yeah slowly i i kind of got tired uh, of all the of all the work and and then i invested more time in film criticism and when I did that, um, something happened. Uh, the digital revolution arrived, and uh, and, everybody so was, stayed, uh, and, every, and everybody stayed in the same hotel. Everybody began <laughs> to stay at the same hotel. Yeah, and 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 I saw as almost like a second chance, you know, maybe to to restart my my production because I had frankly become tired of of all the video thing um, of. You know, sometimes I would see a, a beautiful video, mm -hmm. and uh, and then I would see a, a very bad film, and and the film would get more attention than the video, and and it got tiring after a while, you know, and then digital came came mm -hmm. around, and and everything just became 
cinema. It was quite beautiful. And that also opened different doors for you specifically, no? in terms of also continuing this experimentation with other formats. Yeah, but I but I was still, I mean, I still worked at the very end of the film um, era. Uh, mm -hmm. I did the electrodomestic. I shot it on 35 millimeter. I post-produced uh, green vinyl in 35 millimeter also, and the little cotton girl. Mm -hmm. um, as we got to the end of the first decade of the, you know, the the previous decade, uh, digital became uh, the standard. And, and but even neighboring sounds, I still shot. I managed to shoot it in thirty-five millimeter. Uh, Aquarius and Bakurao, I we just had did not did not have that choice. It would feel too eccentric, uh, you know, with all the logistics of shooting on film and. And having it developed in in the U.S. or France or Mexico, maybe. Uh, sure. So we we just did not have that choice, and and we shot it with you know with the Alexa, which is a great camera. But but it just made me think about all the different formats I went through in in twenty five years. You know, yeah. a lot of cinema. There there is a. There is an aspect of cinema which is highly technical, and and I went through you know just just about everything: VHS, Super 8, High Beta Cam, Super VHS, and Mini DV, DV Cam, and HD <laughs> 35, 16. <laughs> I haven't tried 70. I want to try mm -hmm. 70 someday. That that is the ultimate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, and how were you combining as making, you were making more films, your films were traveling more with your, with your work as a film critic. Did that create some tension or not necessarily? Yes, yes, it did. Um, well, I mean, uh, I, in fact, I benefited uh, in terms of the, the, the way short films are looked at uh, and, and also in the beginning uh, videos because they, people didn't really give them a lot of attention. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I could kind of quietly uh, make my films and, and then write and, and work as a film critic. The problem is that I became kind of, it's not that I became famous as a film critic, but I, 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 was, I became more and more known as a film critic. And, um, and then when my short films began to get more attention, the, the attention on both sides became um, just uh, inappropriate. So I began to not write about a number of films. I, I would all, almost hand in a list of uh, films I, I would rather not write about because I knew people and I don't know, I had been in competition with them and it just became uh, very kind of strange. And my editor at the time, he he was very patient, actually, and understanding. But but it just grew more and more um, awkward, I think. And um, so when I was prepping uh, neighboring sounds, it just became crystal clear that I should leave criticism. I should quit, almost like um, you know quitting smoking, uh, <laughs> I have to quit, you know, it, it, it's just a fact of life, I, I have to quit. And, and the day I quit criticism, the following day, it was a Saturday, I quit on a Friday and on a Saturday I began pre-production on Neighboring Sounds. And it felt, it felt good. Before we talk about neighboring sounds uh i'm really curious about what was the impetus in terms of making the, the, the recording in progress documentary film uh critical in 2008 uh where you interview numerous critics and, well, and, and filmmakers yeah. yes before neighboring sounds um um in fact this is a, an interesting thing because uh, a, a lot of the a, a lot of the people who love uh documentaries they Sometimes they complain to me, but I'm not really, I'm not actually responsible for this. But uh, uh, some of some journalists, they say that I have made three features 
but I have made four features because Critico is a, is a sure. documentary feature. Uh, and then some some of them jokingly say, yeah, well, but, you know, fiction is real cinema. <laughs> and I won't go into that discussion. Um, but Critical was, uh, I, 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 as soon as I began to write as a film critic, I I, I began to to look at people and and try to understand the, the human aspect of of writing. Mm -hmm. It's not something that bothered me, but it's something that I was sensitive to, I think. And many of my friends and colleagues, people I knew on both sides, they they had a more, they seemed to have a more pragmatic view of criticism, uh, as in you, well, I mean, you have to write, you know, just write. And then I say, but I don't think I should interview her or him because I saw the film and maybe I should just stick to writing about the film. I don't think I should interview her or him. Mm -hmm. I don't think I should have access to all the, all the information that, that would lead me to have a different idea of the film after I talked to them. You know, th those kinds of things were not very clear and they still, they are still not clear to me. Uh, even today as a filmmaker, sometimes I'm interviewed by the film critic. And of course he or she is very serious and, and professional and, and a great, a good writer. Um, but I still think it's a bit, it's a little, um, I still think it's a little, um, complicated uh, from from the, the point of view of being human, you know, and trying to, how do you use the information that, that you access through this human contact that you had? Um, so all, some of these things, they, for me, they were interesting in terms of, of analyzing and, and trying to understand and, and, and asking questions to both Film critic, film critics, and and filmmakers, and and the other thing, of course, is and I mean, it's something that I that I have all. I think I I've always felt like that about images, the images we make, you know, the mm -hmm. the images we shoot. I think each piece of image we shoot as filmmakers, and it, I mean, it's the same thing for journalists and and critics and and poets and and write it. Everything we do, it becomes a document, you know, it becomes a, a piece of memory for the sure. future. So I was, I, I, I suppose I was really into the idea of, of recording these interviews any way I could, because I had this little mini DV camera, uh, which cost uh, maybe $800. Uh, one CCD, very simple, very lo-fi. And I, I had it with me everywhere I went, you know, everywhere I traveled. And and I would just go like this and, and say, can I ask you a few questions with the video camera? And I said, oh, sure. <laughs> and then wreck. <laughs> and sure. and that's how the that's how the film was done. Not even uh, sound equipment, you know, the sound was the sound from from the camera. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, and a lot of the filmmakers, they were, they were like this because uh, it was such a low <laughs> angle with this little shitty tripod that I used. But but sure enough, um, the other, the, yeah, the, you know, with time went by, even a few years went by, and then we lost some, someone, uh, someone died, and uh, and then I realized uh, he died, but but I have that interview. It, it's so strange to see him. It was such a great afternoon, you know, of so and so. I, I won't give names, but some of these great people that I interviewed, they some of them have passed have passed away, and uh, and that was the first sign that that I was right, you know. Um, not not only in death, but also in ideas, in the texture of the image, in mm -hmm. in the way the film was done, in in my own self. I. I 
I, I can see myself in a couple of shots and, and I'm a completely different person because that was 20 years ago now. So I was really attracted to the idea of developing creative. And then something else happened. Uh, Emily, my, my partner, producer, mm -hmm. and we lived together. She was the one who asked to see those tapes. Um, mm -hmm. I think it, I was probably six years into the interviews. And she said, can I, can I look at these tapes? I, I'd love to have a look at them. And she said, yeah, sure. And then she saw the tapes and she said, this is, this is uh, something special because the way it was recorded, uh, how it was recorded, uh, it's you, it's them, it's film. And I think we should try and, you know, do something with, with these interviews. And, and that's how Critical came about. Yeah. I mean, you're mentioning Emily, she's played a, a, a big role, of course, in, in your work. Uh, how has been that uh, professional partnership? Uh, has it been difficult also separating the personal and the professional? Can you please tell us a little bit about that relationship, um, combining the personal and the professional? Um, normally, it works really well. I think the, I mean, we have our own life, you know, we have kids and then we have work. Mm -hmm. The one thing sometimes I dislike is seeing Emily tense or worried, you know, like all film producers and I mean, filmmakers also, there is some point in, in, in the production of a film that you get really kind of tense and uh, worried uh, because of, I don't know, money issues and logistics. That's the one thing I dislike about you know living with with a producer <laughs> especially because we are making a film together but i think there is a usually we we have had a, a great time making these films and and i love the way she produces the films there is a certain school of film production um a, a certain school of which i i'm not part of which involves a lot of uh, I don't know, yelling and people screaming and just uh, playing with power in a way that I find uh, just abominable. And Emily is completely the opposite of that. And she just happens to be like that. She goes for um, uh, gentileza, kindness, you know, mm -hmm. and she gets things done with kindness. And, and I love that. You know? And the experiences we've had uh, making our films, uh, they have been usually very, very great, you know, peaceful um, working environments. And that's the way we like it. So, you know, you have this very important body of work with your films, uh, your documentary film, and then you, you make the step to make a fiction film. How difficult was to, um, to prepare to, to make the film? Uh, in terms of funding, in terms of uh, making that step also from, you know, having a short films and, and, and a documentary film to make making a, a fiction film? Well, I think I was lucky because the I, I, I had a long time, I, I really kind of took my time uh, making my short films to the point, <laughs> to the point that people, because uh, when, I mean, people keep asking you it, it's almost like um, I don't know. You're in a you're in a relationship. I mean, it happens a lot in Brazil. I mean, we we used to when we before we had kids. You know, me and Emily. And people would just come come to us and say, "So when when you're gonna have kids?" <laughs> I don't know. I don't know when we're gonna have kids. I, I don't know. We have a cat. Um, <laughs> so that was the standard uh, answer. So when I made the short films people would always say so when you're gonna make a you know a real film like a feature film and then I made critical and I said so here is my feature film and he said yeah but that's a documentary you know like when you're gonna make like a real film with actors mm -hmm. a script you know maybe people getting shot or things like that <laughs> um and then I just very naturally developed the idea for neighboring sounds. It, it 
it must have been around for a number of years in my head, you know. Uh, but at some and, point, I, I and just you took some thought, elements from 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 a previous short, you know, from uh, electrodomestic. There's some characters and some aspects that yeah. you brought to to the feature film. Yeah, um, because uh, a lot of those films they were shot in and around my home at mm -hmm. the at that particular neighborhood, which is 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 a very uninteresting neighborhood and and I thought that all of the paranoia that went into uh, the thinking of the middle class I was fascinated and I, I still am but I, I I'm kind of um I think I've I have probably done everything I could with that theme by now um, you know all the 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 ugly architecture and the way people use all kinds of physical barriers to keep the other out mm -hmm. and paranoia and fear and terror, um, even if nothing special happens. Uh, so yeah, that's how the, the idea um, came about. But I have to say that during the, the Lula years, they had a, a very dramatic shift in the way uh, the federal government looked at culture and I come from the northeast of Brazil, which always, always had the short end of the stick, you know, in terms of, of you know, financing and all the money for culture and, and cinema. And with the Lula government, that changed uh, dramatically. So now they had, for the first time, uh, uh, a system of quotas uh, for the different regions. And, and the northeast region had the same number of films to be approved as the southeast i mean historically this is it was almost like a revolution but of course no blood was ever spilled it was just an idea you know just a a very uh, simple uh, obvious idea and 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 when they announced that that this time the script funding competition would be equally divided uh, uh, with all amongst the, the different regions, uh, you know, this light bulb <laughs> lit up in my head and I said, maybe it's time to, you know, to try that script I've been thinking about. And, and, and that's how the script for Neighboring Sounds came about. It, so not only ideas, but also the, the can I say the stimuli, the, you know, the... Sure. The funding, the yeah, the, yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, the, the stimulus. do it, you know, uh -huh. the stimulus. Yeah, <laughs> do it. Let Let's see what yeah. happens, and and that's how, yeah, that's how it happened. And of course, by then, uh, my short films had become very well known within the Brazilian film world, and and I guess people were waiting for a feature script. I think. In that sense, I mean, uh, before we can think about your work, but I find that very interesting or very uh, powerful. Uh, the fact that Brazilian cinema, as you were saying, it was it was a revolution, uh, and even these days, uh, most of the most of the most interesting films coming from Brazil are coming from uh, Recife, from Minas Gerais, uh, from the state of Minas yes. Gerais. Yes. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. But traditionally, it was Rio and and, and Sao Paulo, uh, the main centers of cinema. But not anymore. Not anymore. That that changed uh, dramatically. Yeah, but, but two things, I mean, you, we have to also consider something else, which is the, again, the digital revolution, uh, when, mm -hmm. when technology became more uh, available, uh, I mean, uh, all, all kinds of new filmmakers uh, began to make their films, I was one of them. Uh, and but then when you get the the the, the technology and 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 you add uh, public policies uh, to to distribute the the money the funds uh, more evenly uh, in terms of you know giving voice to to new voices um, and then something happens and and this is exactly what we had. Uh, up until two years ago, when when this whole mess um, became almost like a physical presence in Brazil, and 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 the whole idea now is to destroy uh, 
uh, all the the developments that we've, we've we have observed over the last 15 years in Brazilian cinema um, we were I mean I, I can still say that we are but we were we were having a access for the first time to filmmakers uh, who otherwise would not have access to funds, you know, from um, very diverse, um, racially diverse uh, in terms of class also and, and sexual orientation, um, indigenous peoples. Uh, so it was incredibly diverse Brazilian cinema and, and something that it's not really about the market. It's, it's really about uh, public policies. And I think this is one of the many disasters that is going on uh, in the country right, right now. Um, you were mentioning that you shot uh, uh, neighboring sounds in your neighborhood and actually in, 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 in El Gomez again, even in your, in your apartment. Uh, yes. Uh, so uh, I'm curious how much, how much, how much is neighboring sounds uh, inspired by your own um, how much is autobiographical or does it have a lot of uh, direct elements to, to your personal life? That, that's, that's another very fair question, but very tough to answer because of course, a lot of it is, is, is very personal. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly the way I look at my own neighborhood. I mean, that's, that's definitely, uh, you know, stuff that I, that I could hear um coming from the neighbors um, because uh, it's such a densely populated area brazil of course is a tropical country there are no cold days ever mm -hmm. in this part of the world um when when it's 19 centigrade it's in the newspapers uh, just to give you an idea in the evening so all the windows are always open you you always hear uh, human interaction. So for me, that was a fascinating uh, aspect, which I picked up on after probably af after living in England, uh, almost five years as a teenager. So all, all these ideas, they ended up going into the into the script and into the film, but but the difficult, the complicated part of discussing how personal neighboring sounds is, is is that a lot of some of the ideas they actually come from people I'm close to or people I know or used to know families I used to to hang out with you know maybe families of friends or girlfriend or girlfriends just people I know and and a lot of these ideas they they became the film. I think it's basically what happens to writers uh, everywhere. And sometimes, sometimes uh, to this day, I even meet somebody uh, and then they say, did you, did you remember that story that happened when, and I said, yeah, I probably did. <laughs> so that's how it happens and, and uh, of course, I mean, you change names and places uh, and sometimes people don't even realize, but, but, but these are stories that are part of your life, you know. Were you, were you prepared for the success of the film? Uh, were you, did you imagine the film could have a, such big global resonance uh, and how much did the success of the film affect it? Uh, impacted your life uh, both personally and professionally well i mean i i always try to prepare myself not exactly for failure but but i i i i not i try not to think of success because i think it's it's a bit of a rabbit hole uh, mm -hmm. if if you if i mean you you're editing the film and you're thinking about success i mean it's just not going not going to work um, I remember we went to Rotterdam. The film was initially developed uh, through the Hubert Balls uh, Fund, mm -hmm. like so many films. So Rotterdam was tracking uh, neighboring sounds. And then it was invited uh, for the competition. 
we were happy, me and Emily, we, we were happy that we would at least uh, have this festival to screen the film. I wasn't sure if the film made any sense. Um, and uh, we went to Rotterdam with uh, 10 posters and 200 postcards and, and, and uh, hard drives because we, we actually did the DCP and DCP was a new thing in, two, in 2012. Um, and that's what we had and, and, and we showed up basically and, and the film was, was very well received. Um, and, and I spent the, the whole year really traveling with the film and in, enjoying this, uh, this, uh, th this thing that you can say that it was a success. It was a success in its own, in its own terms. And, and, um, and, and of course, sometimes you hear, you know, this snarky remarks, uh, saying that the neighboring sounds was well received because I had been a film critic. So uh, the film critics, of course, I knew all of them. I was friends with all of them all around the world. But, but, but the, the beautiful thing about that uh, ridiculous remark is people have no idea how many friends I made because of the films I had made. You know, that's a beautiful thing. Neighboring sounds... Um, may introduce the film introduce me to many people introduce me to you introduce me to nashan woolley from the sydney film festival and so many great people you know charles tesson in in saint de la critique and mm -hmm. i mean i could make a list of a hundred great great people you know people who truly love cinema and uh and that's uh that's incredible, you know. You, you get to a festival in Sarajevo, and and the film has already introduced yourself to the people in the festival. That's a beautiful thing. Your next film, uh, Aquarius, uh, also takes place in Recife. Um, yeah. I'm really curious. Uh, I mean, you took about about a lot, but um, you know, did you have Sonia Braga in mind for the roles in the beginning, and how was uh, connecting with her? And offering the no, role. I, I didn't. I <laughs> when I was writing the script, I I kept thinking of uh, a very uh, because the neighboring sounds was so uh, kind of um, controlled and you know the setups are very kind of precise and I thought that Aquarius should be more uh, a handheld uh, kind of a Dahden. Um, Nouvelle Vague, you know, the, the, the kind of a proceed, procedure that so many filmmakers over so many years have decided to go for when they make their films. And, but slowly I also began to think of, you know, think again uh, of, you know, Brian De Palma, Hitchcock, um, kind of really knowing where you want to put the camera and and then of course uh, one of these evenings uh, we were we were at the at the flat where i used to live where i shot neighboring sounds we had friends over on a friday evening we were drinking and thinking about the film because the friends had already read the script and then pedro sotero the dop he said uh, sonia braga hmm. and then everybody just froze and said Yes, of course. So in a break, and then we begin networking, and and in in I don't know, in fifteen minutes we had Sonia Braga's um, not not only her email but her phone number. You know, because you know people who know people who know people, and right. And then I said, so I think it's the right thing to do: send her the script. And we all decided that we should. I should send her the script and, and I did. And in less than 24 hours, she called uh, our home, our home number, landline. Okay. Uh, she was obviously uh, impacted by, by the script. And, 
and that's how we and then i um well we had a number of skype sessions and then i decided to go to new york city to meet her because i i didn't want her to be at the airport at the you know uh, arrivals gate holding a, <laughs> a sign you know uh, <laughs> sonia braga <laughs> I wanted to meet her and talk to her and, and have mm -hmm. a meal. And, and and then I went to New York City uh, and it was a wonderful four days. We were so we were supposed to meet one day for mm -hmm. lunch. And then I would find other stuff to do in New York uh, because I, it, it, it would be too expensive to to fly in on Tuesday and fly out on Wednesday. So I had to stay. Sure. And then I ended I ended up hanging hanging uh, hanging out with Sonia Braga the four days. I mean, we just Love walked. Uh, I think one day we walked eighteen kilometers, uh, oh. <laughs> which was wonderful, you know. And uh, obviously, we we obviously got along, and and now we were just. I was ready to go back uh, to pre production and wait for Sonia to arrive. Uh, Maybe twenty five days later, it was. I mean, I, I the way I'm telling you is exactly the way it happened. Pedro Sotero says Sonia Braga in the middle of drinking, <laughs> and we say yes. Fifteen minutes, we have her email. I send the script. She calls back in twenty four hours, and yeah, that's how it happened. And that that film opens you opens the door for you. Uh, to can to the main competition, um, you had covered the festival can years earlier um, as a film critic and as a film journalist. And how was um, how was being on the other side? What was that experience like? Yeah, that question is is pretty much impossible to answer because I mean it, it was such a radical. Um, so <laughs> it's almost like a you know the, the television. Uh, program or this is your life you know when <laughs> when 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 they 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 bring uh, different people to talk about somebody's life and and it, it's like a, a big uh, big television show in a studio uh, it it was very strange because i i my first time in Cannes was in 1999 yeah. of course as a film critic and I went every year as a film critic and and my coverage of Cannes was actually quite um there was actually quite a lot of um uh expectation every year every every time Cannes would would begin uh, uh the the Brazilian film internet was was very much into the stuff that I wrote in Cannes and uh, I I guess I had a lot of energy and, and and passion to discover films and and i would write a lot you know um i i would write for the for the print media and then i would upload all the stuff to my own film site and it just became a very kind of <laughs> funny interesting exciting moment uh of the year you know when i saw anything between 38 or 45 feature films and, and I would try and write about them. And so I knew Ken quite well, but of course, if you, if, if you have been to Ken, you understand that if, if you're a film critic, there is one special design of Ken, which is only for you. You would never cross those lines to go where producers go or maybe even programmers go and definitely filmmakers who are in competition or actors and actresses so there are many different maps of the same area and uh i mean if, if you know that if you're a film critic you just cannot go through that door it has to be this door here <laughs> if you go through that door you will be pushed away um, and hear some ugly words in French. But if you're an actor, you can go through that door and if you have the right badge. And so it was very strange because now as a filmmaker, I had access to 
everywhere, <laughs> everywhere I had access, I would never be able to have access as a film critic. So that was that was really strange. And the most dramatic moment was the the conference de presse, the press conference, because that was very dramatically where I where I had been maybe a hundred times, and now I was at the table, you know, with the microphones, and it was actually a beautiful moment. And uh, it should never sound. I I I should I would never sound or try to sound. Uh, Blase about it. It was actually very, very special. That year at the red carpet, you know, the cast and crew came out with signs protesting, protesting uh, the federal government, uh, and uh, and and you become a, such a, a very vocal critic of you know the course of what's happened in the country in the past uh, five years. I mean, it feels like a decade yeah, or it, twenty years yeah, ago. It was no? like it's only five, five years it ago. Five years, five years ago, two weeks, two yeah. weeks ago. Yeah. Who knew it was going to get so much worse than 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 at that time? No, but but so um, uh, I'm really curious about how you're taking this uh, also this um, role as a, as a you know as a public person as a uh, as a public figure and and with what's going on with your work and with what's going on in the country. Well, um, I I don't really see myself as a public figure, although I understand that I am because films, they project you and they take you mm -hmm. to places. And often because of my work as a filmmaker, I, I end up with a microphone, holding a microphone or somebody putting a microphone um, near my mouth. And uh, I think it's part of what I do to express myself as a Brazilian artist and as a Brazilian citizen. And, uh, Five years ago, it was five years, 10 days ago, uh, we, we did the protest. At that week, uh, the Brazilian Ministry of Culture was being extinct. Was, uh, they, they were basically doing away with, uh, they were scrapping the, the Brazilian Ministry of Culture, which I think for anyone is a completely absurd notion, a country like Brazil to, to have its Ministry of Culture abolished like, like that. Uh, the previous month, three weeks earlier, uh, we had seen the uh, Congress voting uh, in Dilma Rousseff's um, impeachment. impeachment, which uh, was actually a coup d'etat. It was a very cynical impeachment process where she or no one would ever deserve what she had uh, based on what they said she had done. Um, today, of course, we, we look at what's being done now, what is being actually done now. And uh, people are only now beginning to say that, yeah, maybe impeachment could be interesting. But with Dilma, I think there was a lot of misogyny and um, there was a lot of hatred uh, for the Workers' Party. I was never ever um, affiliated to the Workers' Party, and because of the protest, I was, you know, basically seen as a communist or as a member of the Workers' Party. And finally, in fact, only last week, I finally signed up for to 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 finally uh, deserve all the the names that I was called. Now I'm actually uh, affiliated to the Workers' Party. Um, so it was, uh, it was exactly the moment when Brazil began to derail as, a, with all the accomplishments that we had had, uh, over the last, uh, you know, basically even during the nineties over the, since the nineties, that's exactly when things began to derail and, uh, you know, the way they got uh, Dilma out was unfair, was um, inconstitutional, it was cynical, and it just opened up a whole sewer. That's basically what happened uh, in May 2016. And it was a very strange moment also because we had made a film about a woman who, who was basically attacked by 
corrupt men. I mean, uh, the mm -hmm. difference, of course, is she lives in a in an apartment building. Um, and then when we do the the world premiere at the Cannes Film Festival, uh, the whole coup is taking place with Dilma, who is a woman, and who is being pushed out of her house, government house. Mm -hmm. And 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 that whole cynical process took uh, another three months to to be completed. And it's 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 hard to believe. Even myself, I find it hard to believe. But the day the film opened in Brazilian cinemas uh, on the thirty first of August, twenty sixteen, that was the day she was finally kicked out of the the government hmm. the the government palace. That's the day she finally picked up her things and left. So there was a very strange uh, mix Ireland. of re mm -hmm. reality with the political situation, which energized uh, the film um, very much in, in Brazil. You know, since since the, uh, the premiere in Cannes, of course, with the protest. The protest, of course, was very simple. Um, and uh, I don't think we ever thought that the the right or the conservatives or the far right would be so uh, mad with you know with artists uh, in general in Brazil, you know, because artists became uh, almost synonymous of of the enemy, and I thought that was actually quite shocking. There was uh, reports in the news that the government was trying to. Uh, trying to, to get you return the funding for your first film. Um, that sounded like a, a repealation for, you know, any, um, for your, uh, for being vocal against the government. Uh, what's the, the case of that? Uh, well, that I mean, it was, it was, right down or? it was one of these uh, absurd situations, which makes absolutely no sense uh, whatsoever. And uh, apparently, it was the handiwork of of maybe two people uh, inside the the government who mm -hmm. very pointedly decided to to do this attack. And I discovered, um, I mean, it, it's it's crazy that you 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 have heard of this because. What they, what I discovered uh, during this whole process is that anyone in a in a cynical uh, society can accuse anyone of anything, um, and it doesn't really have to make any sense. All you need is the accusation, you know. For example, Carlos stole an ice cream truck on Saturday. It doesn't matter that you don't even like ice cream it doesn't matter that nothing like that ever happened it does it doesn't matter all you all you need is just send it to a cup yeah just send it to a couple of people in uh in the press and they're obviously you know close to whoever was uh, uh designing this and uh and the next thing you know your neighbor is asking you is is everything all right with the and then you go, Jesus, I mean, it, it's it, the way that the information is spread uh, these days. But it's so absurd that nothing really has ever happened out of that. Yeah, crazy. You were mentioning the impact of, uh, or um, the parallelism that people were seeing in Aquarius with the old mass impeachment. That kind of happened again with Bakurao, no? and also, and, and, and more so, also with the pandemic, yes. you no? Know? I, mean, I mean, even it was like a, you know, of course, a whole different film and setting. Uh, but also, it's, it's very interesting how your films have really played directly, direct relationship with, with what's going on in Brazil. Well, I think um, I th I'm writing, a, I'm, I'm trying to write a new script now. And uh, I, I have, I have been talking to Emily about, I mean, I think it's happening again, because uh, Usually, I mean, some people, when they they need to write, they go off into, I don't know, the desert or the mountain or some faraway beach. They, 
they cut off communication, uh, communications with everything and they just concentrate on writing, which I think is a great thing to do, by the way, I have done it. But in fact, um, my films, and I can tell you that Bakurao and Aqu Aquarius Bakurao and uh, possibly the new one also, I'm always uh, in, in contact with information, you know, I'm, I'm always looking at what is going on. Because I think what is going on now is so absurd. Um, I think the United States went through four years of absurdity, uh, which have um, fortunately uh, ended uh, uh, in January with a big blowout right at the end with the, the capital. Uh, but Brazil is still very much um, going through this moment. And, and I think uh, a lot of that information is turned into ideas. And, and I think that's how probably Aquarius, well, the, the three films actually, but in a more urgent way, uh, um, Aquarius and uh, Bacurau. Um, and Bacurau since, I mean, it, since it, the moment it was released, it has never stopped being um, remembered. Uh, the memes around Bakurao are endless. You know, the pandemic with the coffins and, and the, you know, the hydroxy, hydroxychloroquine uh, became the, the drug brought by the mayor in the film. Um, of course, Bolsonaro and uh, Bolsonaro supporters are the motorbike uh, people. Uh, it, it, I mean, it, it just keeps going. I mean, it's, it's always, uh, it's always in people's uh, minds. You know, the what happens in the film and 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 the way people want the people to react. And so, it, it it's a very interesting uh, phenomenon to observe a, a film that you have you had been developing for many years, and and somehow it seems to talk to to the moment right now. Right, but, and not only in Brazil, no, internationally, and also what's, what's pretty amazing about uh, Bacurau in particular, is that, you know, you, you put me two years ago, uh, and the film's still going and on. I mean, last year, particularly, uh, here in the US, also uh, had a big role in terms of um, uh, yes. creating this new way of distributing films online, uh, you know, the virtual theater Kino companies. Longer, uh, yeah. You, you know, the, Bacurau was a pioneer uh, film mm -hmm. for that. But also, you know, all the all the all the nominations, and and he was uh, one of the the, the number of lists uh, where he was uh, posted as one of the best films of the year was incredible. Mm. Even uh, even President Barack Obama <laughs> included <laughs> including it <laughs> in his list of the best films of the year. So I mean, it, it became really a global phenomenon. It's pretty impressive. Uh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, I I just uh, I I'm happy and I. I find myself, I I think I'm lucky because my films have, have had the good reactions. Bakurao, of course, was a, uh, almost like a special case because I, I wrote it with a very good friend and co-directed it with a very good friend. Uh, there were, before we, we made the film, I, I never told Giuliano before, I told him afterwards, but before I was asking myself will this work i mean how does how does it work in on a film set with two people and the pressure and 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 the sunlight going down and how do we do this you know and but i think um, the chemistry between us was great as it as it has always been uh, as friends and it worked really well and 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 we're you know I, I finally managed to get out of the film, I think with the help of the pandemic and, and concentrate on, on new ideas. And, but Bakurao, of course, is, is something, was something very special. The, the place where we shot the film, the people with, we shot the film, we shot the film with. Uh, yeah, it was, and, and then of course, um, I mean, you, you go for, absurdity and you end up with 
um, realism. It's uh, it's scary, you know, in, in your own country. I, I maybe I, I could have made a, a crazy film about I don't know Canada, um, but no, we made a film about the place where we come from, and and turns out that it's actually quite realistic, not as far fetched as we anticipated. But also uh, another element of the film is that you were also, I mean, this is so hard to, to divide between the, what's called the categories of the art house cinema, which, you know, mostly foreign films made in Latin America have to circulate internationally, but, but you break the record with, uh, or you break the, the wall rather with, uh, you know, with a, getting to a more, a, a wider audience, which also was pretty impressive. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I always think that uh, cinema, the industry, uh, tell, I'm having a kind of a sound problem. I think the battery is going to run out in my, I think um, the, the way I, 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 I said this before about the short films and the videos, and it's, it's very much the way people, um, hang on, let, let me just see sure. this. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think. Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, I mean, it happens a lot in Brazil. Um, for example, I, I know Neighboring Sounds is, is a bit of a, I, I found out actually that it, was, it turned out to be quite a, a bit of a challenging film for some people. But it also did very well in in Brazil. It became uh, it became uh, it became known and it was seen. But the thing is, we never had any money to release it. Uh, I think we had maybe forty thousand uh, dollars to release it to cinema. So even before it left the gate, got out of the gate, it was already decided by the industry, by the market, that it would always be. Uh, uh, an art film, and I never, I never made it to be an art film. You know, it was just the system that that puts it in a in a box and says you're going to be an art film. Sure. With Aquarius, um, which has a central character, it's a very linear story. Uh, it they also gave it the the seal of art film mm -hmm. and. I never, I never, it was never my intention to make an art film. I, yeah, but it's two hours and 25 minutes. But does, mm -hmm. is, does that make an art film? Or, um, oh, that, 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 Titanic is three hours or whatever. You know? I'm sorry? Titanic, Titanic is or, three or, hours. Or, yeah. uh, and then somebody says, well, it's an art film because uh, she's a very independent woman. And I go, holy shit, I mean, this is crazy. <laughs> And she enjoys sexuality, is that, so that makes it an art film. <laughs> so these are the things that really bother me. And then with Bacurau, which, I mean, the, in terms of procedures, I, I made Bacurau exactly the way I made Neighboring Sounds and, and, uh, and Aquarius. It's just a different film. We shot it in the outback, not in the city. Uh, but all the friends who made the other films uh, came back to me. Bacurau and Juliana was one of them now co-directing. But Bacurau has people with guns and situations which are easily recognizable as Western. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we did think about, you know, American, Australian, Italian films, genre films. And and I think when you make a genre film, you you immediately become um, I uh, maybe friendlier is maybe is, maybe that's the yeah, word and uh, and to this day people are still discovering the the very strange film that Bakurao is and 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 we get a lot of reactions as in well in the beginning I thought it would be a, a rural drama the likes of which we see in Latin American cinema and then at some point the mask is off and ah, you you become something else. And, and I love that reaction because I think that's, 
that's what we were aiming for uh, especially thinking about the brazilian film scene where uh, adventure sci-fi and genre films are not seen with positive eyes you know? sure. so we begin the film in a way that people kind of expect and then the film turns into something else in that sense i'm, I'm I, you know i really admire that you've you've taken risks in every in in, in every single of your your feature films you're taking risks and uh, mm -hmm. you define what is expected because I don't think that um, that's something that doesn't get too much talk about. You know, everybody's just looking to get validated and, and getting to the big yes. festival. But but you know, the idea of your tour, you know, like uh, once you have been validated, you have to be doing the same but with a twist. Yes. Um, but in your case, you you know you've 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 done the films you wanted. Uh, I really respect that. And how how do you do it? Uh, how do you um, negotiate with those? With these powers to be into programmers and, uh, and the whole system around uh, to make the films that you want and you know and, and get away with it. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it it's um it 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 certainly feels like uh, it's a lot of work to make to make uh, any film and the films that I had made was it was quite a challenge. Each each had its own challenge. But they never felt like I was taking, uh, you know, uh, they were risky. Uh, I think mm -hmm. making a film is risky because uh, you put yourself into it and uh, you're trying to tell a story and trying to show people. It's almost like um, an album. Uh, somebody comes to your house, a friend, and you say, you want to have a look at this photo album? I think you might like it. <laughs> and then the person sits down and begins to look at the album, but it was your idea to show her or him the album. And I, I feel exactly like that um, when I make my films. Uh, and I keep asking, oh shit, will this album be an interesting album? I mean, will anybody want to look at this? You know, I think that's the big question. And uh, I think it's the big question in 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 all of our minds um, when we and I say we are talking with about my friends and colleagues that will make films. I mean, that's the big question. We don't know what's going to happen. Um, We're and, running out and, of time, and, but I sorry. No, it's uh, yeah, it, it's it it it, it just feels uh, that. Uh, the next one is the, the film I want to make and, and I'm excited uh, to be writing it because I think it's going to be an interesting album for people to see. I was going to say that we're running out of time, but but I wanted to touch uh, upon one, for me, it's very important thing as well. Um, your role as film programmer, um, I also find that, uh, you know, the fact that you you had worked as a film critic, as a film journalist, and you know, such a solid filmmaker, and, but also that you complement all this with film programming. Because uh, mm -hmm. usually um, that's a kind of also a very separate, uh, very separate um, type of work, you know, doing programming versus doing filmmaking. So I'm really intrigued by aspect and, and how, how have you integrated to, to, your, to your filmmaking and, and, to, and to your life in general? Well, I, I, I'm just happy that I, I developed my life uh, uh, just in and around cinema and films. Um, I, I mean, just recently, Bertrand Tavernier died. Um, he dedicated his life to writing about films and programming films and making films. Sure. Um, it's... The, this character of the, the programmer and filmmaker and film critic and, and somebody who writes essays on, on how he or she feels about cinema is, is quite, it's a recurring character in cinema. Um, I, I completely understand if you're a filmmaker and all you care about is making films and trying to make them good films. But in my case, I, I became a programmer as a, uh, as a byproduct of my love for film and, and sharing uh, films with people and making sure that 
you know, the, the programming would make sense and that people would be surprised and uh, breaking expectations, uh, making sure that the sound is amazing and the projection is great uh, and that the tickets are really inexpensive and, and that the quality is surprising for a public uh, funded uh, cinema like the ones I have worked for. So, um, yeah, it's something that I enjoy. Just recently, I, I collab I'm a programmer, the head of film at uh, Instituto Moreira Salles in Brazil. And with the pandemic last year, uh, the, the institution decided to, all the curators uh, decided to get together from all areas, including film, of course. And we decided to develop a project and, and offer uh, and commission uh, works to all kinds of, to a very diverse list of artists in Brazil. It would only, it, it, would, it would not only allow us to have a, a window into what people are feeling and, and living through, you know, the Bolsonaro years and the pandemic, but also, you know, help them financially with a, a little, uh, you know, collaboration in terms of money. And, and we have just over 200 uh, short films. And I think that was yes. an incredible uh, project because um, it's fascinating to look at them today. And by the way, most of them are by now subtitled uh, in English. Uh, it's not only interesting to look at them right now and almost like um, uh, a, a picture of, of what we are going through now in, in, in the world and in Brazil. But imagine um, in 40, 50, 60 years when, they be, when it becomes archived and it becomes, they become documents. I think it's gonna be an incredibly rich and diverse and interesting uh, uh, panorama of, of life in Brazil. So those are little things that really truly make me um, still give me energy to to still have this day job, which I truly uh, really enjoy. And just one last question: um, Last year you were interviewed by uh, New York Magazine when the pandemic started, and um, in that interview you said that that you started uh, the casino club with your kids. Uh, you were watching films every every day at five thirty. Is that still going on? And, and, and what's the experience? 6 p.m. 6 p.m. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's been it's been great. Uh, of course, we have been home now for a year and three months. Uh, we had some truly memorable screenings. Uh, in fact, uh, just behind me is the the, the premium screen, which is. Uh, using a projector and there's a television, a big screen television downstairs, which is for my, the more run of the mill uh, kind of selection. Uh, but yeah, but, but I've, I, I've introduced a lot of um, films that are part of my life, of Emily's life. Um, we usually do a little intro, nothing fancy or formal, just a kind of a fun way to introduce the film. Uh, two weeks ago, we had uh, The Elephant Man, which mm -hmm. had a tremendous impact on the kids. Many yeah, questions about, <laughs> about the body, many questions about, about, yeah, about life and death. And, and it's a brilliant film. It had, it, I hadn't seen Elef The Elephant Man for many, many years. And, and now I realize it's probably one of my favorite David Lynch films, but you know, it was. Um, I mean, we we've we've gone through all every you know the good Pixar's and Miyazaki's and a little bit from Jan Schwankmaya. Uh, sometimes you make mistakes. Um, you show <laughs> stuff that maybe we could have waited a, a little. But you know, it's it's part of the game. You know, just like when you're programming a cinema. You know, maybe that film not tonight. It was a bad decision, but it happens. It it, it happens exactly like when you're programming a festival or or you know 
a movie house. Great. But it, it's been beautiful. Um, there are seven now, and uh, um, looking at the world through books and films is, is very important. Gary, yeah. thank you so much. Uh, great pleasure. Thank you very much. You on, on looking back into your work and uh, and you know we're big fans of your work, so looking forward to you to your new new your new projects. Thank you very much, Carlos. Thank you for having me. And, and, and thank you for thank people you everyone watching. at uh, Cinema Tropical and everybody thank watching. You. Ciao. Ciao.